Jane is the president of the Nary Warren and District Family History Group, and she is presenting today um, on local treasures. And as you can see from her slide, curiosity, who, what, when, where, why. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Um, curiosity is what drives us to question things. As you can see, who, what, when, where and why are all the questions that we then go off and find the answers to or hope we find the answers to. And many of these questions were in our minds during our cemetery walks and in our monuments and memorials team. So these two groups are very active within the Narry Warren District Family History Group. And one of the people at the cemetery yesterday mentioned that, uh, oh, you, you're from Narry Warren. Well, yes, we are Narry Warren, but we cover the whole of Casey Cadinia and um, we're based in Cranbourne now. So this is some of the things that we've come across uh -huh. in 30 years of researching in our local area. So our cemetery tours team started in 1990 with a 10-year project to identify and record all the information on the headstones in Harkaway, Berwick and Pakenham Cemetery. And at the time, the team also had access at different points to cemetery registers. And then um, in 2002, we held our first cemetery walk was at Berwick Cemetery and we've since held 20 cemetery walks and of those 20 cemetery walks 13 have had books produced either after or before with expended, extended stories of the graves that we visited and when so far there's over 700 stories written for our local community for men women and children in six of our cemeteries. Now, Casey Cadinia Remembers Project, or some people call it Monuments and Memorials, and I call it M&Ms because it's quicker to say. They started in um, uh, 2004 and with a, with a plan, a loose plan, to go out and photograph memorials. Now, in 2011, this website was actually launched and the website's loose aim was to record all the plaques and memorials and the names on these plaques and memorials in the Casey Cadinia group. And um, in 2013, we were really, really proud to be um, acknowledged by the National Library of Australia. They considered the website to be important to history and that it should be pres preserved. And it's regularly updated through Pandora and the Australian Web Archives which is curated by the National Library and is available through Trove. So if someone's searching on Trove, it sometimes prompts you back to the Casey Cadinia Remembers site. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to jump backwards and forwards between the two groups because there's lots of complementary times where in cemetery we come across something and then later on the Casey Cadinia comes across a, a connection and a link. So they go hand in hand. And they're, they're two different teams. Some of the people work on both. Some people only work on one and then on the other, but they're all members of the family history group. So this is one of my quirky favorite ones from M&Ms. It's a spelling question. As you can see, we've got two street signs. They're actually, you know, like 100 steps away from one another. One is Hessel with just one L, and this one is Hessel with two Ls, pointing up to the cemetery. And in the cemetery, here is the grave for the Hessel family and it clearly has only one L. I'm sure they um, know how to spell the name of their family. So somebody at the council at some point didn't check somewhere and it just amuses me that um, they've spelt the name wrong, but our M&Ms have um, put it on the website for the world to see. Maybe the council might notice it one day and go and fix the sign. Now trees, for some peculiar reason, trees are a, a big part of the local community and not just the war memorials and the avenues of honour that we're, we're sort of used to seeing, but as plaques at the base of them planted for various reasons. So there's two coronation trees in Berwick. The King George V tree is near the old Berwick Primary School and the Queen Elizabeth 
coronation tree is at the old um, St John of God Hospital. Um, I'm sure there's probably other trees that are around in the in the area that have um, been remembered for coronations. We just haven't come across them yet, but give us time and we will. Then there's oak tree. This oak tree in Cranburn is um, Alexander McMoran oak tree. It's sort of just uh, near the shopping centre, got a little plaque at the bottom and obviously over time it's um, had branches taken off when roads have been widened or whatever, but he was one of the very early settlers of the area. Up in Gembrook, there's this huge log and uh, one of our team is standing here next to the log to give you an idea, idea of how big it is. Um, this is mem memory and recognition of a hundred years of the many families and men who established the sawmills and the railway, timber railways that opened up the local hills communities from Gembrook across to Bunyip and beyond. And uh, it's a seriously big tree that they've planted, well, they have laid there with, it, with the plaque to remember them. And there's more trees. At Narry Warren, there's a, a memorial tree to Dorothy Balcom, who was, um, a fire officer who was sadly died during the Ash Wednesday fires. And there's countless other trees around remembering Ash Wednesday uh, occasions and names. And then there's this quirky, this is a tree. It's a, it's a metal tree, a permanent Christmas tree at Narry Warren North, rather than chop down a pine tree every year, they decorate that and um, it's their permanent Christmas tree. Um, and then the Ash Wednesday memorials um, in our cemetery walks, we've um, come across um, at Harkaway Cemetery, there was Betty Adamson. At Berwick Cemetery, there was Mr. and Mrs. Stevens, and there was a fireman, Lloyd Donovan. And then at Pakenham Cemetery, there's Alison and um, Kerry Medwin. Um, and we told their stories of um, loss in Ash Wednesday in the Beacons, upper Beaconsfield area. And the Casey Canadian Remembers site's got at least eight um, different memorials. This one is Eddie Lowen down at um, Nanagoon. And uh, he was in a service truck with another gentleman and sadly any Eddie didn't survive. And this is a, a interesting memorial you, you can have a drink which I guess if you're fighting a bushfire having a, a drink is something you'd associate with a fireman wanting and needing. So we've then got more trees. These trees are connected to Olympians in the um, Edwin Flack Reserve at Berwick apart from the playing fields being named and the pavilions have got names on them. There's uh, 28 trees um, around. Each one of them has one of these um, plaques underneath it year by year. And it's from 1896 up to 2006. And it's all the gold medal winning Australian Olympians and Olympic, Olympic teams. So sporting clubs are a, a good place to find names. They are also an indication of the growth of a community how people, it's their time off, their social time. In the pavilions, you've got boards honouring the players and the officials and who did what when, and many, many names are at the various sporting grounds. We've also found at Bunyip Cemetery connections to sports players when we've been researching. So at Bunyip, you've got um, the man who was the winner of the second running of the stall gift, Mr. Gross, and uh, he won in a dead heat and they had to have a, a runoff and then there was controversy over the end of it and at the end of it um, he was declared the winner but both men claimed that they were the winner and it was never actually resolved but uh, we had him and then this is um, Mr. O'Hare and um, he was a champion axeman in a period of time when 
if he earned ten pound chopping down um, his log in fifty seven seconds or whatever it was, that was more likely a month's wages in that time frame. And he travelled through New South Wales, Victoria, and Tasmania, competing in in wood shop competitions with a lot of success. And he was very involved in the local community. And then up at Gembrook, we've got um, a scoreboard. This is EAC Russell Memorial Scoreboard. There's other memorials to the Russell family in the area. And um, you can find these things on the website and there's little um, extra bits and pieces and information on the website. There's more sports people. So at Harkaway Cemetery, um, we told the story of Ernie Barker, the 1956 Olympic equestrian rider. And uh, Ernie is also remembered with the Ern Barker um, equestrian arena at Akuna Park in Berwick. And one of the interesting things about Ernie was that he was a man of first. So I'm just gonna read this so I get it right. At 9 a.m. on the 11th of June, 1956 in Stockholm, Sweden, the equestrian competition got underway. Held there due to Australia's quarantine rules, Ernie was riding dandy and he was the first competitor into the dressage ring. He was the first competitor for the Olympics that year and the first Australian equestrian competitor in the first Australian equestrian team. He was the first competitor in the cross country on day two and the team finished in fourth place. The show jumping on day three, Ernie again was the first competitor and at the conclusion of the event, Australia had finished in fourth place. It was seriously amazing story um, of what these men went through and their horses. Um, they had no concept of what they were really going to and they finished in fourth. Um, and Ernie has been remembered in the community. Then this lit memorial here for Bunyip, this is five young men from the Bunyip Football Club. And tragically, they died in a air crash in Daly Waters. And uh, they've been remembered here with their names and their ages. They were all in their twenties when the plane went down. So there's many stories about our um, sporting people and their connection to communities that we've come across. Now this time last year, um, a couple of the ladies from our group put together a fabulous little video and in the video was Jerry the Railway Dog and uh, it was a sad story and a, and a nice story and I noticed on our Facebook page that um, the community have recently held a little remembrance ceremony for Jerry uh, on Friday in the rain. So um, Jerry was a lovely story, but it reminded me of another story we had in our symmetry walk about a cow. And um, Mr. Woodman down at the Cranbourne Cemetery, he had a cow that he had purchased for three pounds, 16 shillings and sixpence. I don't know why it died, but when it died, it was found to have six half sovereigns, one shilling and a threepenny bit in its stomach. That's three pound, one shilling and threepence. It had almost repaid its purchase price. So assuming that they'd also milked the cow and it had more and got their money back, it was a very valuable cow. And it just reminded me of the interesting odd things that come up in our, in our talks and walks. The cemetery walks have um, had different titles. Um, we've recorded the various um, challenges facing early settlers, but at Pakenham, we devoted our talk in 2015 to women. And uh, this lady here, um, Beatrice Thompson, while her father and brother were helping set up the Gazette newspaper. She was forging her own career and um, she had spent 27 years working with the Berwick Shire Council. And in 1952, she became the Berwick Shire Secretary and Rates Collector. And there was a public outcry in the newspapers of she's a woman taking a man's job because it was after the war and people thought all the men should be getting the jobs, but she was chosen as the best person for the job. And uh, she held that position for the next 14 years. She was a bit of a trailblazer. 
And then at Harkaway, uh, we told the story of Jesse Trail in um, our cemetery walk, remembering World War I. And apart from the fact Jessie was a nurse, she was also a bit of an activist. She was an artist and uh, she actually organised the planting of the original Avenue of Honour at um, Harkaway. It was all um, flowering gum trees and she intended it to be a memorial to nurses, but somehow it became a memorial to the men and only a few of the original flowering gum trees are left now. And uh, she also was passionate about her local community, donated money to her local church. I think she donated the money for a church bell from the memory. And she was passionate about the local landscape. So it was sort of a, appropriate that uh, a nature reserve is, is where she is remembered. So some of the other women we've come across, and there aren't that many women, um, is Mary Loveridge. If you go into Berwick uh, Shopping Centre and you're um, behind the hotel there, heading towards Woolworths, you'll see the clock tower and a little rose garden. And the rose garden has, apart from a memorial to Mary, has got a couple of little plaques in there. And one of them is a Red Cross rose for her 50 years of service to the Australian Red Cross at Berwick and Upper Beaconsfield. And then at Narry Warren North, there's a, a nice little park for Claire Robinson. And there aren't that many other women, red, you know, acknowledged around, but we'll keep looking for them. Um, Bowman's Track is a, at Beaconsfield is actually a housing estate, but at least there's a, a a wall at the front with Bowman's track and you might sort of wonder who's Bowman. Um, it's Janet Bowman. And uh, you can walk around and you look at these things and maybe not think about it. But um, if you go and investigate, you find out that there's usually an interesting story behind these people. Now, children figure every now and again, we don't have that many stories of children because they have a short life. But at Bunyip Cemetery, we had one of those real coincidences where we found out about two different aspects of childhood in the early days. So the um, Rogers grave here was a English system where they sent orphan children uh, to Canada um, and William Rogers and his brother were sent to Canada. They didn't go to the same families, they were in different parts of the state of the place. William eventually came to Australia and um, led an ordinary life from then onwards and, and overcame his rough start in life. But it opened us our eyes up to the home children scheme and what happened to those children in Britain. And then further on into the walk, we came across the Mannix family, John and Teresa. And this shows about the industrial school system here in Australia. And it was quite normal for children in a poverty regions without parents for one reason or another, being put into industrial schools. And if you don't go and do your research, you think, oh, that's like going to a tech school and learning how to build something maybe, it's an industrial school. But it wasn't really, it was a rather awful system where the children were given a bit of education, but they were also um, put out into homes and, and in effect made to work for their roof over their head and food. So John and Teresa both grew up with their parents in and out of jail and uh, they John spent seven years in the industrial school situation and Teresa spent eight years. And uh, when they were married, they had a number of children before they shifted out to Kui Rup and Bunyip and on the edge of the swamp. They were part of the um, village scheme to get people into the settlement. And while he was working to clear his block of land, they had to go through the inevitable um, floods that they had. They also endured having their house burnt down and they survived all this. They raised a family, had had a, a long life. He died in his 60s, but she was in her late 90s when she died. So they'd overcome a terrible childhood to actually become a, a happy couple with with 
a good family life. But um, if you just look at the gravestone, you don't realise what's behind the story of those people. And at Pakenham Cemetery, we came across um, the sad story of our Indigenous family, the Pepper family. Lucy Pepper um, had an illness uh, for a long, long time. She was in and out of hospital. She had a number of children. And when she died, she was buried in Pakenham Cemetery. And um, the family wanted her to be buried back at Lake Tyres, where her family was from. But the rules and regulations of the day said, no, that can't happen. The Victorian Government Board of for the protection of Aboriginals, they controlled everything that was happening in their lives, where they went, when they did, what they did. Um, and Lucy, sadly, was not allowed to be buried back with family. So that was in our women's walk. So the next year when we did our World War I walk, we met Lucy's husband, Percy, and her brother, Harry Thorpe. And uh, theoretically, Aboriginals were not allowed to serve in World War I, but um, both Percy and Harry did, along with a couple of hundred other Indigenous men. They went off to war, and when Percy came back, he was one of the few Aboriginal soldiers who actually got a soldier settlement blocked down at Kui Rup. But as we know, a lot of the men didn't have necessarily have the skills. There was the floods that went through, um, crop failures, and eventually Percy um, walked off the land and uh, his struggles continued because he no longer had his wife and children to, to, to look after. Um, while Harry Thorpe, uh, Lucy's brother, he was a highly decorated. He won the military medal for bravery. He was wounded twice, and on the third time when he was shot, he sadly died of his injuries. And um, you don't sort of really connect that until you go and start researching Lucy's story and you find the story of her brother and husband, which we came up with later. Harkaway Cemetery. Um, this is the Koenig grave. Um, we told the story, it was called Ordinary People, of not just the Lutheran and German families who settled Harkaway, but there was a lot of other families who came into the area. Um, and they had interesting lives and it opened our eyes up to how that community was open. Then at um, Pakenham Cemetery, we found so many stories about the Irish. And one of them was the fact that um, they had migration, a migration system where Lord Monteagle was encouraging his tenant farmers uh, to come to Australia. He actually financially assisted them to come. And the Connor, Burke, Frawley, O'Brien and Dorr families all came out and settled in the Pakenham district um, through Lord Monteagle and uh, his advocate for coming to another country where they had a better life. And at the same time, when we were researching the Irish in Pakenham, we came across so many women who were Irish background, who either went into business as publicans on their own right, or were in partnership with their husbands. And when the husband died, they continued to keep the hotel open. One reason being that running a hotel seemed to be an acceptable occupation for a widow or a woman to do um, in a time frame when very few women work. They're basic, basically, you were a nurse or a doctor, or um, you might be um, a school teacher, or you were a mum. Not many people in that time frame were working. Um, so that was another way we sort of went, oh, okay, let's investigate how that goes. Now, over our five military walks, um, we came across interesting, many interesting stories. And the first one was when we were researching um, our walk, which was called Murder and Mystery at Berwick Cemetery. And we came across the fact that John Grant, 
the local lot undertaker didn't have a headstone, but also we found that Brigadier General Cecil Henry Foote, a World War I soldier, a career soldier, and a World War II soldier didn't have a headstone. And um, at the end of our initial walk of murder and mystery, we sat around and we sort of go, this is wrong, we should do something about this. Didn't know where to start. But after a, a bit of help from the Cemetery Trust, from the RSL, from Cameo Memorials, um, we had a lovely Memorial Day, a headstone is now being placed and a little service was held and Cecil is now remembered forever and a day and can be found and his story is now told. And you think, yes, well, that was very satisfying. Good job done. So along with all our various stories, um, there were some very interesting ones. And apart from the fact with, you know, naming the men and uh, what they did and where they did and did they die, there was a few families that stood out for me. The um, Bayer family at Berwick, um, they sort of encapsulate the whole of World War I. Um, there were two brothers, they were of German descent, their father was German, and uh, they volunteered, they both volunteered in October 1914. The youngest one died at Gallipoli in May 1915, and from family letters home, we learned that his brother Lewis helped dig the grave at Gallipoli. Lewis then rose through the ranks to become a lieutenant and he returned to Australia in 1919. He took up a soldier settlement block and in later years he struggled with health issues from his war service. He'd been gassed when he was on the um, Western Front. He joined the fledgling RSL. He encouraged young men to join the local rifle clubs in readiness for another war, which he thought was never going to happen, but did. He married an Australian nurse when he was in England. And while he was away, his widowed mother back here in Australia was working tirelessly for the Red Cross and the war effort. Later during World War II, his wife, Lily, also worked for the Red Cross. And this is Lily here. Um, this is 1950, whoops, too far. This is, my new computer did that for me. Uh, Lily was the first woman listed as a life member at the Berwick RSL. She was um, a tireless walk, worker for the, for the RSL. And then at um, Harkaway Cemetery, was the Koenig family. And this is another case of two brothers going off to war. And we came across letters written between the two men and their sister. And in the letters, we learned about how they tried to spare the family back home of the home truths of what the fighting on the Western Front was like. And sadly, one brother died over there. Tom died in, in France and his other brother came back to Australia, but he came back as an amputee. So we learned about how the amputees went off to trade school and they learned how to be boot makers and how to create a, a job for themselves and a business so that they could support their family. But sadly, um, I guess as families get smaller and smaller and homes get broken up and sold, we found on the internet a website for an auction um, in the 2000s, and it's for these this group of medals, which is um, memorials to Thomas. This little medal here is from the local Jumbuck community. Um, this would have been a medal that his mum or, or his sister maybe wore with his name and his colour patch. And there's a, another little medal down the bottom. And they sold at public auction for close to $2,000. So he'd like to think that maybe they went back to the family, but um, that was a sort of sad part of the war and the fact that there might have only been those young men and no children to, to continue the family on or to remember them or, or keep those treasures. Ships is another thing that featured a lot in our um, cemetery walks. Um, apart from the Schonberg wreck down at, at Warrnambool, we mentioned that in 2012 at Cranbourne and then again at 2015 at Pakenham. There was also the horror of the fever ships, which we spoke about in Bunyip. And of course, the military walks gave us many connections to shipping. So this ship um, 
here on the left, that is the Ballarat. No, that's the Southland. The Ballarat was the um, ship that we had three of our soldiers from the local area were on when it was torpedoed off England. They all survived. This one is the Southland um, where I think it was five local soldiers were on there and a couple of them didn't survive. That was torpedoed um, near Gallipoli. It was the men who were evacuated off, the ship got refloated. It was later torpedoed a second time towards the end of the war. It went down in the Atlantic. And this one here is from World War II. Not that we've done walks about World War II soldiers. This was actually a story about a World War I soldier and how he survived World War I. Um, he suffered with what we call today post-traumatic stress. And Lewis uh, Carson and his wife and family were living up in near Papua New Guinea during World War II. And sadly, Lewis was captured by the Japanese and was taken as a civilian prisoner. And um, he was on board the Montevideo Maru. And alongside him, there was about another 200 or so civilian men. But there was also, I think it was 900 POWs who'd been captured in Papua New Guinea. On board the ship were 1,053 Australian men, civilians and POWs, and unfortunately because the Japanese um, didn't have any identification on the ship that they were carrying, that they were a hospital ship or that they were carrying um, prisoners, um, they were travelling to Hanan Island in Japan where they were going to be, um, I guess, forced labourers for the Japanese and the Americans um, attacked the ship because it wasn't correctly marked and the ship went down and 1,053 Australian soldiers and civilian men drowned. Um, the connection for our second soldier was in the James Thornell story uh, that we did yesterday. Um, his nephew was one of the POWs who went down with the ship. Um, and you, and you go, uh, that's a little coincidental that um, we do a story on World War I and then the next time we're in Cranbourne Cemetery, we're doing a story that's um, got a connection back to this ship. And those coincidences see, seem to keep coming up. It's like they want the stories to be um, found and told. So then on the home front, um, we learned of the struggle of um, the men when they came back, um, the soldier settlement blocks, how hard it was for them, how some of them wrote sad letters to, to ask for help and assistance, angry letters saying that they wished they were back in, in fighting the war. It was worse than dealing with the red tape and the bureaucracy. Um, there was the women who kept, literally kept, the homes going, kept businesses going, kept farms going, found the time to knit and to sew and to um, have queen carnivals and fundraise. Um, and at the same time, they had to do all their housework and had to raise their families. And they waited, hoping that the um, minister wouldn't arrive with the telegram or the news that they'd lost somebody. Um, those stories were just as heartbreaking as the stories of the men. Um, to hear about a woman being told that her husband's death wasn't caused by a war-related injury, therefore she was put into um, very distressing circumstances and her children were farmed out because there was no assistance for her because the, the red tape said, no, he didn't die of war-related injuries. And we came across the stories of the women who, who waited while, you know, two, three sons went, sons and husbands went. There's Mrs. Lyons at Cranbourne. Um, she had 10 sons. Uh, her four eldest sons served in World War I and two didn't return. She was still alive in World War II and her three youngest sons went to war. And fortunately, they all returned and, and she was alive to see it. So we got to see and learn more about 
the effect of the war on families, not just the stories of the men and their their battles in the you know the mud on the Somme or their battles with the dust and and uh, the horrors of Gallipoli. There was just as many sad stories, but very interesting stories in what happened back here. So I should tell you also before I go to that one, at Lang Lang, we had one of those interesting stories where you just sort of sit there and think, wow, why did this man enlist? As Private Gardner, and Private Gardner, he spent the whole time of his service overseas in and out of detention. He finished up actually in jail in England. He never fired a gun in service overseas. He never went on the battlefields in service overseas because every time he got out of detention, he went AWL um, or did something that put him back into a detention. And you sort of wonder why he enlisted and why he went and what was going on in his thinking. Um, but he was in jail at the end of the war and he actually didn't return to Australia till 1920. And his file noted that his service was no longer required and that he would not receive any war service medals. So you wonder how his family felt that their son didn't come back till 1920 and, and what sort of story um, was told in the family down the years as to um, private gardener's service. And that's all that being at our um, cemetery walks. Um, now, this is our M&Ms. This is one of the posts that we've done this year. Um, it's the Fell family up at Cockatoo. And it's um, this very nice plaque here on a rock and it's on the side of the road. And, and I looked at the post and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I thought, hmm, it says here that um, five brothers went to war and it's one of their nieces who's written this beautiful poem that's on here in memory of the five brothers, two who don't return. And um, the intriguing information that Arthur Rex Fell was a model for the Digger World War I memorials. And that made me think, okay, where's a memorial in our area that's got the statue that we've we've seen at different times, the different communities who had memorials with a statue of a young soldier on the top, the, the traditional digger. So I had to do a bit of a hunt to solve that question, the why and the when and the where. So it turns out that Arthur was born at Stall, and when he enlisted, he, he noted that he was a stonemason. And at the same time as Arthur enlisting, there was Frank Lodge, also born at Stall. He was a stone cutter and his bro three brothers enlisted. So we've got the five Fell brothers serving, two of which are listed as stone cutters and four Lodge brothers, all listed as stone cutters. And my brain's going, this is getting interesting. So, While the two um, of Arthur, Arthur Fell's brothers died, the four Lodge brothers came back to Australia and they went into business uh, down at Hamilton and then with success moved into the South Melbourne Footscray area. And they being all returned soldiers, employed returned soldiers. And when uh, Melbourne was um, deciding on a memorial, the Lodge brothers were the winning award to actually construct the Shrine of Remembrance. And I'm going, okay, there's more connections here. So along with that, in 1927, they opened the granite quarry at Tainong. Um, and I'm thinking this is interesting and then I'm hunting around and I find out that two of the men that the Lodge brothers employed were, you guessed, Arthur and Ted Fell. So these two young men who'd come back, um, who were stonemasons before they went, 
when they came back, they were the stonemasons who were working at Tainong and working at the shrine in the building of the Shrine of Remembrance. And uh, I thought, okay, that's that's answered that question. I've got, I've, I'm go go with that. But it turns out that the story of Arthur being the model for the um, the digger is correct. At the Australian War Memorial, I found this photograph of one of three different poses that um, he, he was captured in. And the reason that the Lodge brothers chose him to be their model is he was the, actually the youngest of their men who had served overseas. He still looks, for someone who's gone to war, he still has that young look about him. And uh, they did three different versions of him. And uh, I have I don't know if any, any other than the one at Karen is the only one that's close to here. Uh, this one is at Beauty Point at Karen. And um, the interesting thing is some of the uh, models are made here in Australia. This particular model was made in Italy from Italian marble must have cost a lot of money. It's a Lodge, it's a, a Lodge Brothers actual memorial and um, it is definitely of Arthur and uh, it's on the Lodge Brothers website, but it's the only one that's, that's clearly identifiable as him. The other one is um, in Upper Coomera in Queensland, which is a slightly different version. And that one, the modeling, of the statue was actually done in Victoria. Um, and you think, yes, it's, it's worth hunting around um, to find these things. Um, and, it, and again, it, it just shows, like Heather said this morning, you get something and you go, oh, I, there's a question there. How can I find out more about it? Um, and that's basically what, our monuments and memorials is doing. They're recording the names um, of people. Um, it's leading you to the story of why was that person's name on something. Um, if you go into the cemeteries and you look at the headstones uh, and you start to look at um, their story, it's opening your eyes to a myriad of different things that may not be in your family or in your local history, but it's recording simple, ordinary, everyday people's stories and connections. Not everybody's famous, not everybody's notorious, not everybody is a pillar of society, but all of our local community over the years have contributed to the community in one way or another. And it doesn't matter whether their name's on a memorial or not. I find it really interesting that there's actually a toilet block with a plaque because it was opened by a councillor. And I thought, well, that's nice for the councillor, but I think it would have been much nicer if it had been opened by somebody who was desperate for a toilet and wanted it built in the first place. So I know that's a relatively short talk for me. I normally talk a lot longer, but there was too many stories and it was too hard to, to decide which ones I should tell you about. Um, I have to thank um, Lynn Bradley from the Family History Group uh, for all the photography she's done over the last 20 years. Um, Heather for her wonderful blog on Casey Cadinia links to our past, where a couple of our photographs came from. The Pakenham Gazette and the Weekly Times newspapers, um, I found photos there. The Australian War Memorial, the State Library of Victoria, Public Record Office. The Kingston Local History website is where the um, photograph of Arthur Fell is at um, Carrum and the Virtual War Memorial uh, is where I found um, the other photo of Arthur. Um, and, and I guess the thing is, um, there is a, an old TV series, I'm going the wrong way. There's an old TV series and it was called The Naked City. And at the end of it, it concluded with 
there are 8 million stories in the naked city. This has just been one of them. I don't think we're going to write 8 million stories, but we're well on the way to our first thousand stories. That's it. Thank you very much.